asking a lot more every time I go to pick up a beverage that is not water. I'm like, Lord Jesus, please do something so that I can end this fast. Change the world. Change me. Change whatever you need to change. Change this water into a cup of coffee. Just change, Lord. Somebody brought up the idea that this month, in November, we're, we can't have communion. Because it's actually, the first Sunday is before the sixth when we end the fast. So we were thinking maybe we'll just have little vials of water and we'll pray for the water to be turned into wine. And we'll see how that works. You know, we have, why, why, is the, why is the communion clear this time? So We've been talking about the kingdom of God for several weeks. And I believe there's probably a question that some of you have asked. Now, it's great to talk about the kingdom of God, but how do I do this? How do I fit into this thing called the kingdom of God? The YBH question. Yes, I, I agree with you, but how do we do this? And this morning, we're going to have three testimonies from three people. I love this, that the Lord brought testimonies into our midst this morning to encourage us, because the meat of what we're going to look at uh, this morning comes out of uh, Acts chapter 18, and the illustrations of how it works out comes from the lips of people that you worship with every week. And so I want you to open your Bible this morning, and we're going to start in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. I'm going to read two verses there, then I'm going to read a verse out of Acts chapter 4, and then I'm going to read some verses out of Acts chapter 18. And here's what it says in Romans chapter 12, 4 and 5. Just as each of us has one body with many members, everybody say many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We talk about this a lot when we're doing spiritual gifts assessments and when we're trying to find out where do I fit in the body of Christ? This is the one thing I want you to remember from this scripture this morning is that you are not like the person who is sitting next to you or across the aisle. So the way this message works out for them is going to be different than, it way, than the way it works out for you. So look at somebody and say, I am not like you. Okay? There are, in this room, some people who love to participate. And anything comes up and you want to be there, you want to be involved, let's do it, let's get on board. And then you have some that are spectators. We're going to do a whole series in October about the taters. Okay? How many of you, how many of you are, are uh, like taters? You like taters. You're from down, down south and you like taters. Better than yams, right. Well, we have the yams, the 20-something, 20, 20 of the 20-something yams are out camping this weekend. They call it yamping. They're having their retreat over it. Did you go last night and, and, and loosen their 10 pegs up? Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is one of our elders, by the way. I, you know, why don't you go and pull a prank on the youngins? But... Um, when they find out that this is recorded and they find that out, you're going to, you know, you might get your house toilet papered or something, you know. <laughs> but, you know, one of the, one of the things uh, uh, about as we, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm thinking about toilet paper in somebody's house, you know. Where was I? <laughs> taters, yeah, the taters, right, the taters. We're going we're gonna to look at a variety of, of uh we have the imitator, and we'll have the spectator, and we'll have uh, a whole bunch, of, whole bunch of taters that we're going to look at, and, and look at how God might want to use us as a member of the body of Christ. And some of them are healthy, and some of them probably aren't so healthy. But if you're a spectator here today, I want you to realize that you're going to be in the game. The expectation is that you would be in the game. And it's not going to look like the person next to you because you're different to them, but get in the game. What does this look like in the real world when you're working 10 hours a day and you don't have any time for anything and you're watching the kids or the grandkids or you're doing this or that and you got responsibilities and you got school and you got... What does it look like for us 
to be the person that God wants us to be and to be in the place where he wants us to be and fulfill the call that he has for us on a day-to-day basis. There are two people that I want to look at. Their names are Priscilla and Aquila. And I had never seen this before this morning when I was actually using them kind of as a, as a side illustration, and I looked at something, and I saw how God used them specifically, and he said, that's what I want you to share this morning on these three areas that Priscilla and Aquila understood, having been encouraged by Paul in ministry, but what did that look like in their areas of influence? Now, if you notice, the signs are still up from last week. We have media and family, and we have, back there, we have business and education, Government, arts and entertainment, and church and religion. The seven mountains of influence in any society, any, uh, any culture has these seven mountains. And we as God's people, kingdom-minded people, are being raised up to influence these areas. So what does that look like in your life and in my life? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 18. And I want to read verses 1 through 4. And then... I'm going to skip down a few verses, read a couple more verses. Here are some testimonies of how this works out in the real world. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them, and every Sabbath they reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, they had been displaced from Rome and went to Corinth. Corinth was not typically your um, nice churchy town. It was a port city, and there was a lot of Uh, There were a lot of Navy people, seamen, that went across the isthmus at Corinth, and they had all of the things there that every guy who's been cooped up on a ship for a while wanted. There was wine, women, and song, and this was the place of debauchery. Then they would get back on their boat, and they would go again after after they crossed over the isthmus. So this is where they go from Rome, the center of this great government political system, and they're kicked out of Rome. They go to Corinth, and that's where they meet with Paul. Now, it's it's debatable whether they actually met him there for the first time. It would seem like in some of his writings he already possibly knew them, but he at least met with them there. Romans chapter 16, verse 3 says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, They risked their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles were grateful to them. Paul's going to get back to that uh, later on. But he greets them and he greets the church that meets in their house in Romans. So these are people who are tent makers, but they have a house church in Rome. Then they come and they're, they're sent away to Corinth... Paul meets them there. They have a, uh, presumably, a house church there. And he works with them building tents. They're in business together. Doesn't sound very spiritual, does it, building tents? Well, what do you do? Oh, I'm a tent maker. Oh, nice. It was exactly where God had them for that time and for that purpose. They could take not only their the church with them, they could take their business with them. Set up a business in a new city, boom. They had people there that loved the Lord. They went, they reasoned in the synagogue, and they went and they talked to the Gentiles, and they brought them together in their house. They had the church, they had their business, and then the Lord calls them to go over to Ephesus. Ephesus. Look in verse 19, 18 and 19. It says, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters, and he sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Senethre because of a vow he had taken. They arrived in Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. And he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. 
So they go from Rome, they go to Corinth, link up with Paul, they go over to Ephesus, and Paul says, okay, I'm leaving you here, see ya, and he leaves. Now we know that they stayed in Ephesus because in 2 Timothy 4.19, Paul says, greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. And it says that they there probably were helping Timothy with the church in Ephesus. So they go from Rome to Corinth to Ephesus. Paul leaves, and then there is a divine appointment for them in Ephesus. Acts chapter 18, or verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of Scripture. And he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue where Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who, by grace, had believed. I want you to see this again. Aquila and Priscilla are in Rome, presumably doing their tent making. They go to where? Corinth. And what do they do there? They make tents. And who did they meet there? They meet Paul. And so then together, the three of them go over to where? Ephesus. And Paul decides he's going to go... Right, and who, who, does, um, uh, who do Priscilla and Aquila meet in Ephesus? Apollos, a divine appointment for two business people that loved the Lord, were called by him, and then moved around by him. Acts chapter uh, 17, verse 26, reminds us of the sovereignty of God. Now, this is right before this. From one man, he made every nation of men. This is God. That they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Anybody surrendered to the will of God when he moves you? My story is one where growing up in Pennsylvania, nobody in my family left Pennsylvania. We all stayed there. They're all still there. And it was very clear that the Lord wanted me to move to Lima, New York, a little podunk town with a Bible college where I would meet my wife. It was from there that I did an internship in the big city area of Laurel, Maryland. And I said, but God, I must go back to Pennsylvania. Surely I can leave for a little, but come back. And the Lord said, no, I want you there. And through a variety of circumstances, he brought me to this church, having met someone in that church that told me about this church. And I became four square. What if I had said, no, God, you can't move me to this place, to this place, to this place. Here's three principles that I want you to see. And the first one is going to be illustrated by, uh, let's see, Bruce. You're the, you're the first one that I want you. The, the first principle is trust that God knows what he's doing when he moves you. Now, for me, it was a geographical move. For Bruce, it was a move within his city servant service. Go ahead. All right. Well, uh, long story short is that uh, I remember when I went to the pastor, when I originally said, you know, I, I know God stir me. Should I stay firefighting on the engine or should I go? I had an opportunity to go into the fire marshal's office. I was on the fire engine for 19 years. The Lord spoke to my heart and said vanilla and chocolate. I think the pastor and I were working on the bus or something. We were out here. And I said, Pastor, what do you think? He said, well, Bruce, I think it's vanilla or chocolate. <laughs> and I do, and I do that. Well, the Lord just went vanilla, chocolate, whatever I decide to do, God's going to bless me. 
is what it turned out to be. So I went on into Marshall's office and was a fire inspector, then became a deputy fire marshal. And, and it seemed like God always stirs me or moves me. I, I just get, he won't let me get complacent in any certain thing or, or real comfortable in that. So what happened was a guy I worked with, it was time for, he was thinking about retirement and he was talking about it, but he never would take any action. He was our plan reviewer, but he was also a, a deputy fire marshal. But he did the site plans for anybody that comes in to the city of Chesapeake that wants to build a business or extend a business or whatever, they have to submit a plan through the city and it has to go through the fire department and many other, many other departments through the whole city. So uh, what happened was is that he came in one day and he told the told him, says, hey, I'm out of here in two weeks. Well, he had done this for 13 years. So everybody was like, oh, wow, what, you know, what are we going to do? And I'm like, ah, I'm, they loved the way I was doing inspections. I was doing my job the way I was supposed to do it. And I'm not saying that with, you know, pridefully. I'm just saying I was out there doing what I was supposed to do. And they were really pleased at how many inspections I could get done a day and investigations and handle all that. So one day I'm coming in, and, and so I thought, well, I'm safe. I'm safe from this because they really want me out on the street because they like what I'm doing out there. And all of a sudden, I get called into the office, into the chief's office, and they set me down. I'm like, huh? I'm like, okay, what, what's happening here? So they look at me and say, hey, uh, Bruce, uh, you know, it's like this. And I went, oh, gosh, what in the world? So the fire chief says he wants you to go into site plan review because he feels like you're the best fit, and we agree with him. Well, when you're in the fire department, you don't look at them and say, no, I don't, I'm not going to do that. You don't have a choice. Well, they tell you whatever. You know, hey, you're going back to the station or whatever, you're gone. There's no question about it. And I was like, oh, man. You know, at first I was like, oh, but to myself, I, I just told them, hey, whatever, you know, you tell me what you want me to do. All right, well, this guy did it for 13 years. I was thrown in there with him for a week left before his retirement. And he already retired. You know what I mean? He checked out. He'd go to lunch, and I wouldn't see him till 4 o'clock. He went over a few things with me of what I needed to do and how I had to handle this and all the different departments I had to, had to deal with and email and certain contractors, engineers, uh, architects, the whole, everybody. So anyway, I was like, okay, Lord, I know this is you. You've put me here. Uh, help me. And so I went in. I dug in. I, I studied the code. And what happened is, is that, as the scripture says, you know, when you do your work right and do it before the Lord, he puts you before kings, and he'll put you in high places. Then I found myself going toward, toward meeting with council members, meeting with the city manager. The fire chief would call me up, hey, I've got to meet with the city manager and the mayor. I want you there. And I'd have to explain the code to the city manager. I had to explain the code to the mayor and explain why this business has to do this. But yet I could offer, I was able to offer especially one particular church they were building. They were running into all kinds of roadblocks. And, and then I talked about the intent of the code with the mayor and the city manager. They were all ears. And I said, well, they can ask for a code modification. They can do this. It's not doing away with the code, but it's saying they can meet the intent of the code. And we were able to help them be successful. So, and God just, I remember engineers would call or from over at City Hall, and I'm like, it, it, oh, Alabama wanted to rise up in me. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know. But I said, no, God, you put me here. I know you're going to provide. You're going to do it. So anyway, I was, God has put me in the, in the influence of a lot of, now when the mayor sees me, he says, hey, Bruce, hey, how's it going? And then he can add, he'll ask me questions about certain businesses. I say, hey, mayor, Mr. Mayor, we're moving right along with this, that, and the other. But it has opened opportunities to help businesses and to help others be successful and, and, a, and have a uh, good experience when they come in to build in Chesapeake. Not a bad experience. So anyway, that's, that's what I want to share with you there is that I didn't go, I could have kicked and screamed all the way, but I knew, I said, God, there was a purpose, there's a reason. And so, you know, you just had to do that. <clears throat> and you went to the fire marshal's office. It was kind of like your Corinth on the way to Ephesus. Right. You know, you, you were yeah. out of the, the station where you had been, but you went right. to kind of this temporary place until God opened up the door for you to get there. Right. They weren't going to leave Rome to get to Ephesus until they were forced to go right. to some place on their way. And, and <clears throat> go ahead. And one other thing is, is that what is so wonderful about the Lord <clears throat> is that he's given me the ability and the strength 
to continue my investigations, continue my inspections, and do site plans. Mm. So what glory does that bring to him? Yeah. You're like, man, how did this guy do this? A man of influence clearly put there by God. Now here's the question to you. What places of influence has God put you in? What places of influence? You're, you're, you're there in that place, and you can say, oh, I hate this place, I hate this place. Or you can say, God, how do you want me to influence this place? You're influencing City Hall because he has placed you there. Okay, that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is not only is it places, but I want you to look for these divine appointments. You know, even when some of those things come up and you're like, ah, it's an opportunity for my influence to be able to shine. Or there's a person that comes into your place and you say, it's like you have radar. It's like, doo -doo 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 -doo. you just know that's somebody that I need to talk with. Apollos was one of those types of people. You can make a difference in these people's, these individuals' lives. So it's not just places, but it's individuals within those places. John, will you come and share about how the Lord placed you in a place so that there would be individuals that could be influenced on an everyday basis? You know, some people think that business is just about making money for the kingdom of God. Somehow your tithes will then support more missionaries and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it's about discipleship. Well, I got all my uh, notes here on uh, three sheets of paper. I shared it with my wife, and she uh, she says that's a little heavy. I uh, I got a check in my spirit, so I'm going to try to do it, but kind of off the cuff. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for the chance to to witness and testify. Several weeks ago, in our staff meeting, we were talking about, and Pastor was sharing about the seven mountains, and the Lord brought to my memory uh, my experience. Now, I've been retired since uh, 1998, but it all came flooding back, and as I thought about it, it's even clearer that um, God does place us in unique situations, and, and he is faithful probably need to start with a little of my background. I, I, um, I graduated Virginia Tech, went in the service, came back, tried to find a job. Finally found a job as a draftsman after having gotten a master's degree in architecture. Um, and the things were a little tight uh, at that time, but I worked several places and finally ended up with an architectural firm um, there were two partners, and they took me in as a draftsman. And over the next 38 years, I, uh, I had an opportunity to work my way up in the firm and uh, become an associate, then a junior partner, then a, then a senior partner. And in those later years of my partnership, I was partner in charge of production and you know, handle the finances for the firm. So I had a lot of interpersonal contact with people and the planning and the paying of bills of um, dealing with uh, engineers with consultants and suppliers and anyway in that period of time 60 to 70s um, there was a real move of the spirit in Tidewater uh, the charismatic movement was flowing uh, full gospel visit then was going and I was caught up in all of it I was in a Presbyterian church. I was uh, an elder in the church, and the Lord was just stirring my heart. And during that time, we, we met with a, a, a group of people, and um, I'm getting a little ahead of the story, but um, we started meeting with the young people in the church on Saturday night, and then we'd come to the Presbyterian church Sunday morning. Anyway, out of that little group, we formed a church. The Presbyterians asked me to leave when they found out I spoke in tongues. Um, I was defrocked, and uh, that began my 
excitement about serving the Lord in a special kind of way. Well, all of that bubbled over in to, to my firm because by now I, I was in a place where I could make some decisions. And I began, you know, sharing Jesus with everybody. I mean, you couldn't come in my office if I didn't, you know, say something or, or ask you, did you know Jesus? And um, over that period of time, I... Uh, I know that uh, our firm, well, when I left in 98, we were four partners, three associates, and about 50 people. And I will say that 90% of those people were born again believers by the time I left. And that last 10% had heard about him, but they're dragging their feet. <laughs> but it was a unique place or position. It wasn't a condition of employment, but when I interviewed somebody, I, the Lord just gave me a special anointing in my spirit. I mean, I don't know what it was, but all of this is hindsight now looking back. So I encourage you that as you go through the mountain, the place in the mountain where God has placed you, he doesn't give you all the light at one time. It's, it's like that famous picture that holds the lamp and shows light on the path. God gives you enough light for one step at a time. And that's kind of the way my whole career was. But I know that um, God, at, at one point, I, after I really got filled with the Spirit, I wanted to quit work. I wanted to pastor a church. I wanted to have a, a church so bad. And I kept asking the Lord, praying for it, praying for it. Finally, it really came through to me that the Lord wanted me at that time to be a Christian businessman witnessing in my life my words and my actions and incidentally i had a bad mouth so it took me a while to get all that straightened out but anyway my witness and my testimony grew as i grew but um, um life was just it was just different um i'm thinking back now of um, people that been across my path and have had an influence in my life and that I've had an influence in. Um, I know one was a, a guy named Charles who had his own business. He was a uh, reproduction person. He would come to the office, pick up plans and specs, go back and run the prints and come back. And through witnessing and, and dealing with him, he came to know the Lord. He turned his firm around. It became a Christian firm. And he is currently serving in a state office with the Gideons International. Um, there was a second one. There's a guy named Mike who was a, a draftsman. And I kind of lost track of Mike. And about a year ago, I was over at the region uh, with some things and doing something with CBN. And Mike came walking up. And lo and behold, he's currently serving on the telephone uh, prayer counseling there at CBN. Been there for five years. Probably the, the last one, I guess, is a young man named Tom. And uh, Tom was a, an office person in our office for, I think he said, 11 years. And I recently talked with Tom, but Tom went on to, from Shriven Hall, the firm that I was with for that 38 years, to become a pastor. And so, you know, when I look back, God gave me some unique opportunities to share Jesus. And ex what did it explain better the, the, the way? The way of the Lord. And so uh, I encourage you to bloom where you're planted. Uh, I wanted to be a pastor, and I think that's the paradigm shift that we come to think of church as a pastor and a congregation. But God's calling you to be a pastor where you're planted, your mountain, and to not only witness, testify, that is the evangelism part, but having evangelized and then to disciple. And so that was part of the message that you're sharing this morning. And in the old days, we'd say, in the natural sense, who would have a baby and then abandon it? So when you bring a new Christian to the Lord, you don't abandon that person. You continue on. You disciple, you train, and you share with him. So I, I, I need another hour, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I'll just stop there. I, I've been uniquely blessed. I've been uniquely blessed with a wife that uh, knows more about the Lord than I, and she's kept me on that right path. 
And so it's been a, a great pilgrimage. But if I can do it, you can do it. Believe me. Uh, Those four-time fishermen, they're like me. Uh, but they did it. They shared it. It grew. As they recognized in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, they were unschooled, ordinary men Amen. that had been with Jesus. And then there's the second Timothy 2, 2. Which says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust a reliable man who will also be qualified to teach others. <laughs> so remember this, he calls us to places of influence. In those places are individuals that need discipling. And this we see in, a, in Apollos, Aquila, and Priscilla. And there's one more thing. And that is that when they took their tent-making business with them, their livelihood, they used everything about them to influence the culture. They influenced the culture. The place, the people, and then a cultural transformation. You see that really in Ephesus when you look as they, they more than likely were working with Timothy and the cultural transformation that happened in Ephesus. I'm going to ask Rachel if she would come and just share a few things about her vision and her desire for taking the kingdom of God to influence cultures even through business. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to just start telling the story from my own perspective. I had completed a master's in biblical interpretation. My intention, I love biblical studies. I want to teach. I love that. But I also love missions, and I studied a lot about missions as well. So God miraculously opened the door for me to go to a Muslim country that's restri very restricted, closed access. The same year I went, earlier in the year, they had kicked everybody out. The, when I was going, they closed down the airports after my plane left and opened the airports where I had to land when I was going. So it was just, God gave me the money. It was just miraculous. And while I was there, uh, one of the things that had drawn me to that location was I had been reading on um, United Nations. They have a human rights commission, and they had done a report where they found, like, uh, thousands and millions of children, particularly or especially boys on the street, who were, you know, making up these little gangs. So in, in the major cities, there was, like, 11,000 here, 15,000 there, a lot of kids. And probably from about the ages of 8, 9 to then teens. And what these kids, what this report said was they were, of course, being abused in multiple ways and using drugs, and then they were gangs. Well, by the time I got there, of course, the United Nations puts out a report. The government is quickly going to do something about it because it's a black mark on them. So the government had started organizations to deal with it, but really a lot of the problem just kind of submerged. So it was still there, but it was not on the surface. So I was like, well, God, why did I come here? And in asking questions, I was drawn to ask the question, what happens to divorced women here? Because of, you know I'm a divorced single mom. And what happens to them? How do they survive? And what I was told was that a lot of them survived by selling themselves. And that was very hard to hear. And um, what happens is, uh, say the husband takes another wife, and the first wife isn't happy with that. Okay, she gets kicked out. She's lucky she gets her kids, or unlucky, however that may be. And um, now how does she survive? Or let's say the man just leaves or is abusive. In, in cases of abuse all across these regions, you have to have an, a disability resulting from the abuse that makes it impossible for you to work after 40 days. And you have to have a medical certificate. Well, that means the doctor has to actually give it to you, which if it's a case of spousal abuse, they probably won't. They'll tell you to go work it out with your husband. Women go to shelters. There are some shelters which become kind of places where other men come to prey on them. So you have this cyclical abuse in society. Young girls who are, a man might come and woo her. He probably has another wife and says, I'm going to leave her. I'm going to marry you. She becomes pregnant. And now she's cast out. So 
the family of the wife or the woman, whoever the woman is, whether she was married or a single mother or a young girl, the family can't help her. They won't help her. In some cases, they're obliged to kill her. Okay? And, and sometimes the dad will say to the son, if you don't kill her, that's your responsibility to kill her. If you don't kill her, then I'm coming after you. And so you have these women, and sometimes they'll start selling themselves, and then they get put in jail. Now their kids are on the street. Well, we believe that the gospel has the power to transform a person's life and to transform society. When you go to this child and tell them Jesus loves you, and they believe, and then what? Or you go to this lady and you tell them about Jesus. And first, to even get to talk about Jesus, you have to build up a very a strong relationship to know that they're not going to go and turn you in. Right? Because you're proselytizing and that's against the law. Okay? So you're going to get kicked out. Or if you're a, a national believer, then you might get killed or stuck in jail. So to share the gospel... You have to establish a, long, a relationship with this person to where you can actually tell them about Jesus. So let's say you do that, and you're talking to this lady who you know, you know works the streets at night. Maybe she has her little child with her and sets the child outside and then comes back and gets the child. You set up this relationship with this person. You win their trust. You know that you can talk to them about Jesus. Now what? Well, she believes in Jesus, and she knows that what she's doing is wrong, but how does she feed her child? Now, for those familiar with a little bit of mission history, you know that well, there's a lot of mission history. Let's just boil it down a little bit. There's something called rice Christians. A rice Christian is someone who becomes a Christian because you're giving them rice. So some denominations say, well, we'll help you, but only if you're a believer. Okay, well, then I'll become a believer, and then you'll help me. So one of the ways to counteract that is you give assistance to everybody but nonetheless just giving assistance creates dependence not independence not strength it doesn't they start to think well the west needs to help me or the stronger or the richer or i need somebody to help me i don't have it within myself to break free of this addiction or of this job so out of that conversation and that series of questioning i came to realize that i needed to have something more I know that's kind of hard to swallow. Not You don't need anything more than Jesus, but you need to be able to have something, tools to give them, a set of tools to be able to build a life and get out of that. I mean, can you imagine having your children and having to live like that? Being outcast, being beat. There's cases of women who they'll tie and chain the door on their house so that they can go to work with their children inside. It's cases of, you know, they, they send their children to work in homes and the children are abused, the girls primarily. So this is where, what is our Christian response? And a lot of times our Christian response is, you know, give or do some sort of half-baked business. But I think that with the divine wisdom that God has given us, with the Holy Spirit indwelling us, we should be able to come up with strategies that put the world to shame. Now, what the U.S. does is great. And U.S. aid, I mean, they've had programs across the Middle East. It's the Middle East Education Partnership. They've done so much. However, you can't tell me that the U.S. can do more than what some believers come together. And we know that our citizenship is in heaven. And we know that our king is, you know, our, our kingdom is a, it's of another world. So that's the challenge is how do we take the gospel in very practical ways? How do we offer something where people can get out of those things? How can we offer them a life and in that process transform society. There's cases where in, in sub-Saharan Africa where um, the women are abused and they're beat down. And I'm sorry I'm focusing on women. It goes across the board. Men and women need help, but those are just my examples. Uh, and they, they're, so their status is beneath men. And what they, in some cases, have done, they have like a GOAT initiative, right? And so they have a little community. Let's say there's 10 families. And to those women, they go and 
they give a couple goats, and when she has, when those goats have a couple more goats, those goats go to the next one. And by doing that, gave women an equal standing because now they were bringing money in. Now they had to be respected. So doing this transform society where you might not be able to come in legally. You might not be able to come in and preach. You might not be able to come in and teach. But business is that key. And you know, I, I thank you, Rachel, for, uh, for sharing that. You, there's, there's something to be said about a God idea for the transformation of a culture. And sometimes God forces you into a place you know, hey, you're moving from here to here, and you see it, and you take advantage of it. There's other times where he gives you that individual that you know, they walk into your office, and you've got you've to do this. And there's other times when he gives you a vision that is way bigger than you, Rachel. But you are studying. You are going to school. I felt like there was a word to somebody here that the Lord has given you this vision that's bigger than you, and he's been saying I want you to go back to school. It's not just a good idea. It's a God idea. And he says, I want you to go back to school, and I want you to get a degree in this. And you say, but God, that's not even my calling. And he says, I want you to do this because I'm going to put the pieces together, and you're going to see it when you're obedient. So I don't know who that's for, but that's something that I felt this morning. I wrote it down, and I said, uh, I wasn't even connecting it with you sharing, but you're in school to do what God has asked you to do, even though you don't see how it's all going to come together. You just have all these pieces. So there, there are cultures to be influenced by where God takes you and the people that he places you in, the places, all of those things. And he says, will you just say, put me in, coach. <laughs> I, want to be in the, I want to be in the game. Or maybe you're in Corinth right now and you're saying, you're angry because... God took you out of Rome and he took you away from your nice little life and he plopped you down over here and you're saying, okay, I'm scrambling to put everything together. What's going on here, God? And he says, just hold tight because you're going to meet somebody that's going to take you to your Ephesus. You're going to put down new roots and you're going to do something there that is going to be transformation. I know we've had many conversations of God, what are you doing in life right now? You're in Corinth. And it's okay. It's all right. I have great confidence when I read this story of Priscilla and Aquila that God knows what he's doing. If we come out of this with one thing, folks, God knows what he's doing. We can look at all these mountains around us that need influence and we can say, oh, life's, it's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, let's just come into our turtle Christianity, you know, come into our shell pull our head in, and just let, all, let everything happen outside of there and then poke our head out to see if it's all okay. Well, see, I think turtle Christianity should be this. God says you go, you got your house on your back already, some of us literally, got your house on your back, you just go to wherever it is that he says, you set up camp there, and then you say, oh, over here, and then you set up camp over here instead of pulling our head in the shell and, and waiting for life to just blow itself up. Anybody in? I know you're in. Here's the thing, folks. It's not going to happen by just simple divine intervention like we pray. You know, in this fast as we're praying and just saying, oh, God, oh, God, just do it. Just take care of everything in the government. Take care of everything in our families. All oh, our families are falling apart. Oh, this, that, and the other thing. Let pray a couple of prayers and, you know, a little dab will do. Let's go. Move on with life. Start drinking coffee again. It's going to happen as we pray and catch God's vision for how he wants to use each individual of us. I think it was in the prayer time this morning where somebody said, okay, God gives us a, 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 he anoints us, but then he expects us to be involved and do something. Where are the places? Who are the individuals? And how does he want us to influence that culture? I'm excited about this because I don't know the answer to any of those three questions. Right now, God's called me here. I know that. That's the place. And I look out and I see a lot of individuals and I see a culture here that can be shaped and I see pieces of it. But I don't think any of us see the whole thing. But I want to see it. Piece by piece, moment by moment, 
individual by individual, so that we get to this place where God says, okay, I've been able to use you to influence every one of the areas of your society. So if you're all in, and I don't say that lightly, I want you to stand. Because here's the thing. We can either live mediocre, spectator Christianity, or we can be a participator and get in the game. I want to be in the game, folks. I want to be in the game every day until Jesus comes back or I go home. Don't let me sit on the sidelines, Lord. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. Could we just sing that, James? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's what I want to do. I want to pray over us, and I want to send us forth as ambassadors, as those that are going to places, meeting with people, and influencing cultures, just like Priscilla and Aquila. Father, that same confidence that Priscilla and Aquila had when they were going through this unsettled life, God, there's, there's just this confidence, this raw confidence and trust as the word of the Lord came forth this morning. Confidence in knowing that you know what you're doing and you're placing us in those exact places with those exact people at the exact time for your purpose and your plan. Lord, as I lift my hands and surrender to you, I say, here I am, Lord. Continue the journey that started many years ago but I don't, ever, well, don't want to ever sit down and say, this is where the journey ends, until you say, this is where the journey ends. Let me finish strong, Lord. Let everyone here finish strong, and let us have the eyes to see what you're doing in every moment of our life. Lord, I'm all in. Would you just say those words or similar words? If that's your heart's cry, whatever, whatever that looks like to you, say that to the Lord as just the affirmation of God I'm all in in this thing. I, I, I'm, I'm a bit unsettled maybe right now and some things that are going on, but I'm all in. Just whisper that to the Lord. Just say it to the Lord in your own words. As I send you out this morning, I want to read those those words that I spoke when Susan was up here, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He knows what he's doing. He's got you right where he wants you, and he's going to use you for his plan and for his purpose if you say yes. Amen.